All right. Labor Day weekend is now over. The feast is done for the first week of the college football season. And man, a lot of stuff happened this weekend, but it started with the inevitable expansion of the college football playoff to 12 teams. Now, we don't know when this will be implemented. Will it be implemented in 2024 or will it be... Or will we be waiting it out until 2026? Uh, guesstimation, probably going to be 2024 when we see it. So the end of the 2023 season that we'll be seeing this. Uh, first round is going to be on campus. Maybe the second, third weekend of December. And you go to the uh, to the quarterfinals. Those will be like at bowl sites or whatever. Even though those should be playoff games at the home site for the top four conference champions. Yes, that's right. Top four conference champions will be the top four seeds. So the top six conference champions and six at large will make it. So that means a group of five team can get in. Maybe even more group of five teams can get in. That means, you know, the SEC could have like three or four teams in. The Big Ten could have like three or four teams in. So, you know, um, my stance on the CFP expanded to 12 which I didn't, I didn't, I, I'm, I'm still not completely on board with it. I'll have to get over it. Um, I just, I, I feel like a baseball fan right now. You know how baseball expanded their playoffs to like 14. Now they expanded it to 12 teams too. Because uh, originally it was technically 8. But you know, they had the wild card game. You know, for like 4 teams. So, you know, it is what it is there. Um. Uh, but the CFP expanded to 12. I just don't. I just don't see it. Um, you know, the, people say, "Oh well, there's going to be more teams into it for the championship and everything like that." I just don't see it. I didn't see 12 worthy teams last year. I really haven't seen 12 worthy teams throughout. You know, the years I've been watching CF, um, CFB. I, I just haven't seen it in college football. The compromise I would have went to was eight, and that's pretty much what you know a lot of other people have been saying who are against expanding. You know, you know so much. You know, because I mean the the jump from four to twelve is already crazy enough. Like you jump from four to twelve. Don't use the FCS as an argument here. You cannot use the FCS or D two or D three as an argument. Those divisions really. Um, they have teams that win championships all the time, you know, have literal dynasties, you know, you're, you're forgetting about North Dakota State, Mary Hard, Baylor, Wisconsin, Whitewater, teams like those, Ferris State, even though they, you know, they won the champion, I believe they won the championship last year, really, it's still the top teams, you know, making it all the way, despite the fact that they have large fields. And I've said the FCS needs to go to six, needs to go back to sixteen anyway. I just don't think there's twenty four teams worthy enough. Hell, there's been five lost teams in the FCS playoffs before. Hint, hint. Western Illinois a couple years ago, I think. So I, I, I just don't see the appeal. I get it. The top six conference champions will get in. I get that. You know, I get the six at large will get in. I get that. But at most, I probably would have did like eight, you know, you know, at the five, you know, power five conference champions, you know, divisions are deregulated now and everything like that. So, you know, you won't have to see like a five loss team in the ACC or whatever get in. So, you know, it, it, it's, the divisions are deregulated. So, you know, the top two teams can play for a division championship or rather for a conference championship. And you know, get that. So there's really not going to be too much problem with that anymore. You know, with the whole three, four loss team thing. There's still probably going to be three loss teams in the 12 team CFP, but it won't be, you know, as much. There's still there's going to be a lot of two loss teams, not a lot of one loss teams, not a lot of undefeateds because that's just how college football is. And it's still it's still going to be the elite. Is this going to help recruiting at all? NIL? No. Whoever's, whoever's got the most bang for your buck is getting that scholarship. Whoever's got the most recruiting power, the most drip, the most pull, the most game is getting the recruits. You know, it's just increasing access to those who, you know, probably should be in. You know, this is, this is, a, this is you know, 
This is a game for the elites. You know, you can you can you know cry all you want about you know like 2017, 2018 UCF did not think those teams deserved it. Uh, you know, they can they can claim a national championship like you know like UCF did back in 2017, and hey, they they technically earned it. They technically earned it. They technically got a poll to select them as the national champion. It is what it is. UCF is a national champion. What can you say about that? You know, like keep bringing up TCU Baylor from 2014. I don't think TCU would have gotten in because they lost the Baylor. Why do y'all keep bringing up TCU and Baylor when TCU lost the Baylor that year? Baylor won the Big 12. There was no conference championship for the Big 12 back in 2014. Stop bringing that team up. They did not deserve it. <laughs> hell, they should have been. Hell, they should have been six anyway. <laughs> like, come on now, the Big 12 should have had a conference championship. They should have had it Louisville and Houston back in like 2010, 2011, like they were supposed to, and it would have been fine. You know, for the Big 12, they would have. It would have had teams there. They would have had you know guys at the ready if they had a conference championship. You know. Like almost a decade ago, but they didn't, and that's just how the cookie crumbles. You know, you see, you know, you know, other arguments, you know, out there, you know, those are like the two biggest ones, you know, that are out there, you know, in the, in the college football landscape, the wide and vast college football landscape that has been argued about, you know, with the whole who should have been in and everything like that. And I just never thought those teams, those specific teams, should have been in. It just, it just is what it is. Like. You know, they say, oh, well, this is the same, you know, four teams, you know, that get in every year when, you know, who, who are those four teams again? You know, Alabama hasn't made it every year. Ohio State hasn't made it every year. Clemson hasn't made it every year. You know, Georgia hasn't made it every year. Oklahoma hasn't made it every year. Notre Dame hasn't made it every year. You know, you're trying to name off usual suspects, you know, who haven't made it every year. But it is what it is. We're going to 12. Again, I'm just going to have to accept it. A lot of you are going to have to accept it whenever it gets implemented. Uh, but I'm still going to watch it. I'm still going to watch it. I mean, it's college football. I'm going to watch it. You know, We're going to have more football. You know, First round, quarterfinal, you know, these games may or may not be competitive. It just is what it is. You know? But, I mean, what can I say? Until it actually is implemented in full, can't really say anything you know, about it going to 12 anymore it's just it's happening so there you go with that um let's talk about the games themselves because this is a wild wild week one that started on thursday night west virginia pit the backyard brawl returned after a decade of a hiatus this was a fantastically terrible game in all the best ways i mean you got MJ Devonshire picking off JT Daniels at the last possible moment. Like it went off of Bryce Wheaton's hands. He had two TDs in this game. But Devonshire picked off JT Daniels, took it back with like three minutes left to go, and Pitt got the game winner. He got the game winner. Devonshire got the game winner off of that. Keaton Slovis, he was he he was he was efficient out there. You know, it felt like both these quarterbacks at times could not throw the ball effectively. You know, there were there were times where I'm just sitting here looking at both of them, like what what kind of throws are these? You know, Slovis had 305 yards, but it didn't feel like he had 305 yards at times. And then you had guys like C.J. Donaldson who only ran the ball seven times, but he ran it for 125 yards on the Pitt Panthers defense. It's crazy. Uh. Central Michigan put up 44 points on Oklahoma State. You know, despite the fact that Spencer Sanders got six touchdowns, you know. Um, still, Oklahoma State, you allow 44 points. Not a good look right there. Penn State, Purdue, also on Thursday night. You know, you had the Aiden O'Connell, Charlie Jones connection being on point. But Purdue never ran the ball when they needed to. And I mean, they 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 let Penn State back into this game. This is I almost went with you know Jeff Brom for the college coach's moment of the week, but we'll talk about you know another coach. In fact, the game that just finished. We'll talk about that game that just finished in a moment. 
But Penn State, led by Sean Clifford, who's also a six-year senior, it was battle six-year seniors. Clifford, able to lead the comeback with a two-minute drill to win this game for Penn State, and that is a soul-crushing loss for Purdue. Soul-crushing stuff right there. You got to be disappointed in, in, in Purdue. They they should have had this game. You know, a lot of people, some people are picking Purdue to win the Big Ten West, and I think the Big Ten West is going to be a gauntlet to the point to where I can't even possibly predict who's going to come out of this division it's like it's not even it's like not even crazy it's like wow what 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 do you mean Who, who's going to win the big 10 west i genuinely don't know um let's go to saturday and some of the other games that happened you know early on saturday you know nc state east carolina i said this is going to be a lot closer than a 10 point spread and that's exactly what happened. Devin Leary and the Wolfpack, they struggled in this game. You know, like this is a home crowd for the Pirates, and they have a lot of intense hatred for the Wolfpack. But the Wolfpack were able to win this game. You know, that poor Pirates kicker, he missed two kicks that were crucial, including the game-winning potential kick. And like NC State, they survived this game 21-20. And I mean, it's just... It's just, it's just crazy. Like, you know, we could have had an upset like that, and instead, no, that's not what happened. And then, the, you know, the other games that happened earlier in the week before we get really into the later games, the meat, the meat of the topic here, you know, the two thirty, the seven Eastern, the um, the, the Saturday, the, the the Sunday games, and the Monday night game. Let's talk about some of these other games. You got Illinois blowing a lead against Indiana. The refs missed a key touchdown that should have been a touchdown for Illinois. They missed the field goal that should have been a missed field goal by the Hoos, and they gave the Hoosiers a chance, and that got them seven. But it, but Illinois shouldn't even put themselves in the situation to where Indiana, you know, was able to come back. It is what it is just absolutely disappointing for the Illini. Ref, ref ball moment of the week has to go to this game for the refs being absolutely terrible in this game. You got Iowa beating South Dakota State with two safeties. Not one, but two safeties. Seven to three, but with two safeties and a field goal. Iowa, Iowa's offense is absolutely it was rough out there. South Dakota State is expected to, you know, be a top four team in the FCS. You know, a potential FCS city finals. So congrats to them for really, you know, making this a completely unwatchable game. Because this is a rough game. You know, Iowa's punter got to be the real MVP here. You also had Old Dominion beating Virginia Tech. Rutgers, they beat Boston College. Delaware beat Navy. William and Mary beat Charlotte on Friday night. Delaware beat Navy on Saturday. And then, you know, North Carolina App State was wild. I, I figured I should have just watched this game from the start. But, you know, there were some other commitments I had. So, you know, that App State UNC game was bonkers. App State scored like 40 points in the fourth quarter. And yet they still lose because they, you know, missed a couple of two-point conversions. And it's just, it's just wild. Crazy stuff at the end. And then you have Houston UTSA, you know, Clayton Toon, he put on a show. Like, this game went to three overtimes. The Cougars won this game barely. Clayton Toon played lights out. He had, you know, what, three touchdowns, you know, uh, ran in on one in overtime. You know, Frank Harris and the UTSA Roadrunners. Again, I don't know what people are smoking. UTSA won a lot of games last year. They were the Conference USA champions last year. This is this is no slouch of a team. Okay. This is no slouch of a team if you're a casual. We know this team can ball. And they did exactly that in a loss against the 24th ranked team in the country. And, you know, the AP poll is going to come out in the morning. And it's going to change, you know, only slightly. It's going to change only slightly. There may, there's probably going to be just one team that drops out of the top 25, and we'll talk about that team in a moment. But first, we got to get to the Pac-12. Pac-12, what a horrid performance by the top two teams of the Pac-12. 
Oregon, Georgia in the Chick Lake kickoff Saturday edition. Bo Nix, terrible. He threw two picks in this game. Oregon gets smacked around by Stetson Bennett. He had three TDs. He had over 300 yards passing, and the Dogs' defense was all over the Ducks. And that, you know, pretty much knocks Oregon, you know, out of the discussion for really any big-time wins. And I won't say the CFP yet, but a lot of people are saying that for them, along with Utah. Uh, Cam Rising, despite the fact that he and Anthony Richardson traded blows throughout this game. This was a good game right here between Utah and Florida. He threw a late pick that lost Utah the game. And, you know, they had, you know, Utah had the moments to where they had Tavion Thomas in situations that just didn't, you know, work. You know, there was so many situations for Utah in which plays did not work. And Anthony Richardson, he was the difference maker out there. He ran for 104 he had three TDs in his game. He threw 169 as well. This was a fantastic game between Utah and Florida. And Utah, there's no big-time conference win for them either. Uh, Pac-12 is not going to be easy. And I already said, you know, I don't think there was going to be a Pac-12 team that was going to come out. And you know, make it if they lose. And I didn't, I, I didn't think, you know, I didn't think this game between Utah and Florida would, you know, get this crazy because it got crazy. And it was a damn good game. I didn't think the Oregon Georgia game would be as bad, but it got bad real quick. It was 28-3, you know, in like the first half, and I was like, I'm out. I got to find something else to watch. The game you should have watched in the afternoon if you didn't want to watch Oregon, Georgia, and you didn't want to watch Houston, UTSA, you should have watched Cincinnati, Arkansas. This was a this was an eliminator. This was pretty much an eliminator too. You know, lots of penalties in this game. Helmets for Cincinnati kept flying off, and yet KJ Jefferson, you know, had four TDs. This man played lights out. The defense for the Arkansas Razorbacks was just too much. For the Bearcats, too much for them, and you know Cincinnati. They had a good effort in this game, real good effort, a lot better than they did against Alabama. But Arkansas able to get that W, and you know not they're going to knock Cincinnati out of the top 25. This was the game that was going to knock somebody out the top 25, and that's exactly what happened with Cincinnati and Arkansas. And then you have Notre Dame, Ohio State, the biggest game of the weekend, in my opinion. You know, one of the biggest games anyway. Tyler Buchner, the Irish, they, they they played very well. That defense played very well. You know, Stroud, he was all right out there at times. He, you know, couldn't make the plays needed. But he, he did throw two TDs. You know, Mayan Williams, he got the game clincher in this game. And Emeka Abuka, he stepped up in place of Jackson Smith and Jigba who uh, I believe Nick Jibba got injured in this game at one point. But ultimately, again, you know, the Irish were just overwhelmed by Ohio State's running game and the defense, which really stepped up. This was a big defensive showdown. You know, really good stuff right there. Loved every second of defensive prowess in this game. The game I circled as the game of the week, Jackson State, Florida A&M, was also a game that was, you know, over by the first half. Like, we're talking Shadur Sanders completed his first 17 passes. He only was, what, he was 28, he was like, what, 20, 28 of 33? For like 300 yards? Five TDs? Aubrey Miller got a focal recovery touchdown. The defense got a pick six. Jeremy Moose and the Rattlers, you know, despite the fact that they played North Carolina very well, they did not play well against Jackson State at all. And it 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 fits with what I was saying, you know, you know, during the preview, is that Jackson State, you know, this team might go undefeated. It kind of fits with what I was saying. Like this Jackson State team has a lot of talent. You know, you had Trash Hundred. He did a he did a couple things in this game as well, but what I was trying to you know get across is that you know Jackson State might go undefeated this year in the FCS. They might go undefeated. Um, they have Campbell later on, and um, Campbell's uh, they looked pretty good this week, and the rest of the SWAC you know mostly beat them up games. You know some 
got beat up, some did the beating, like Southern, who a lot of people are rejecting, will take on Jackson State in the SWAC championship. So, you know, uh, I think this Jackson State team will go undefeated until the Celebration Bowl, at least. If they win the Celebration Bowl, hey, what can you say? Dion, Dion has them boys out there in Jackson working hard, you know, despite the fact that they ain't got no water. Um, hopefully, hopefully, um, the situations at Florida A&M with the whole administration are resolved soon, and hopefully Jackson, Mississippi's water situation is solved soon as well. The game on Sunday night, you know, after you watch the beating, after some of y'all watch the beating anyway, because I know not all of y'all are in the HBCU football, but after, you know, that, Sunday night was Florida State LSU inside the Sugar Bowl. It was Jordan Travis and the Knowles. They played LSU very well at times. Like, they outplayed them at times. Jade Daniels and the Tigers, they, they countered. They countered. And, you know, at times it felt like Daniels was just, you know, scrambling around trying to do too much. But he got what he needed to get. And he put LSU in a good position. And Travis and company put Florida State in good position. Like this was a fantastically fun game. Unfortunately, Leap Neighbors, you know, he muffed a couple punts. One, one of them in the first half and the other we'll talk about as we go through, you know, this crazy sequence in, you know, in this game. You know, not only was there a muffed punt, there was a missed field goal opportunity. Not like an actual missed field goal, like Florida State should have taken a field goal and they decided not to early in this game when they could have took a control and had a 13-3 lead. But, you know, Florida State, you know, the final minute and a half or so, Florida State was just trying to ice the game, you know, win this game, to, you know, you know, take, an e take the easy way out and win this game. But instead, they fumble at the goal line. You know, they fumble at the goal line. LSU drives down the field. Almost, you know, technically probably should have, you know, they, they had one second left in, in regulation to get the playoff to try and tie it. They get the TD. You know, Florida State ended up calling a timeout. Anyway, the refs were on something, you know, during this whole sequence. And yet a, a blocked field goal ended the game. And Florida State did beat LSU in this game with two blocked field goals. Not just one. Not just the one important one. They had another one earlier in the game. So, I mean, this game was wild. This was a great, great game. You know, a lot of people are projecting Florida State and LSU to be like, you know, middle-rung team. But hey, these two teams, if they continue to play like this, you know, it's going to be entertaining. The ACC, and you already know the ACC's had a difficult, you know, difficult time to start the season. And, you know, LSU was the only SEC team that lost. So, you know, it is what it is. Kayshawn Booty, he was pretty much a non-factor for the Tigers. He only had two catches for 20 yards. Kind of disappointing there. You know, he was he's an All-American, which I was surprised that, you know, he was a preseason All-American. Like, I... I Genuinely don't pay attention to preseason awards enough, apparently, because uh, I just don't see it. And apparently Florida State didn't either. Meanwhile, the game that just ended, uh, Clemson and Georgia Tech, this was a rough game at the beginning. We're talking DJ Uilagalele. He struggled for about three quarters. But then, you know, Clemson was able to get in the high gear. I mean, they were, there were two punts that got blocked, leading to... You know, Clemson taking control, the, the latter punt block, you know, com complete control for the Tigers that led to, you know, the Tigers putting up 41 on Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech only had 10, but it felt like at times, you know, Georgia Tech was able to get the best of the Clemson offensive line. You know, Brian Brees, he was out there, you know, playing lights out. Rest of the clubs in D line was out there playing lights out. I mean, you had Jeff Sims throwing an interception on the first play of the game. You know, I didn't, I didn't think this game was going to be as crazy as it was. But then, you know, you have to, you have to be, 
you have to be stupid to have some of these decisions that Jeff Collins made. My hashtag college coaches moment of the week, it goes to Jeff Collins for the dumbest decision making I've ever seen in my entire life. You're talking, this man had 43 seconds left in the second quarter, decides to not use a timeout. There's a penalty on the Clemson, you know, 10 second runoff, so now that's 33 seconds. And then, you know, Clemson still doesn't, you know, they, they're, they're letting the clock go. Georgia Tech doesn't use the timeout. And then Jeff Collins continues to use timeouts at the worst possible times. He had no timeouts by the time the fourth quarter, you know, we're talking second half now. No timeouts left in the fourth quarter. A flex bone play. You know, a jet sweep from the flex bone that didn't work. You got Jeff Sims out here running for his life. You know, it, it, it was it was rough. You know, Georgia Tech, again, they might have one of the roughest seats that I've ever seen in my entire life. They're, they're, they're going to run the gauntlet this year. And, I mean, you know, this is, this, is, this is not how you want to do it right here. It turned into a blowout at the end, but it really, it really should have been, you know, it, it, should, have, it should have been that. It, it should have been a lot closer than what it was supposed to be. So what can I say to Clemson, Georgia Tech, other than I don't think Clemson's the number four team in the country either, just so you know. Uh, I really don't know who could be the number four team. That's, uh, that's what I was saying. You know, weeks I've, I've been saying this for a couple weeks now. I really don't know who the number four team is. I don't think it's going to be Oregon. I don't think it's going to be Utah. I don't think it's going to be Clemson. It's going to be somebody. It's going to be somebody. I don't think it'll be Notre Dame just yet. But we'll see how the season goes, you know, everybody. We'll see how it goes. So what about the other games? Uh, the Most of these other games that we're going to talk about here are just blowouts to wrap this all up. BMI, they took on Wake Forest. Mitch Griffiths in place of Sam Hartman. He had three touchdowns. The Deeks did struggle for a hot minute, though. You know, Western Michigan, Michigan State. I watched this for about an hour. It's Peyton Thorne through four TDs. Sam Houston got shut out by Texas A&M. Sam Houston in a transition year where they only have nine games scheduled, by the way. Um, Haynes King, he did not look that great. He had two picks, but he threw three touchdowns, so it kind of bounces out. Colorado State, they got dominated on defense. The Wolverines were efficient on offense. Kate McNamara, he's looking like it'll be him that starts you know but then cookman they took on miami and tyler van dyke had three touchdowns Parrish jr over 100 yards two tds for him miami put up 70 on the wildcats and you know i don't know how but then cookman's gonna do in the swack this year but uh 70 points by miami oh ooh, right there utep Took on Oklahoma, and, you know, UTEP already lost to North Texas last week. Dylan Gabriel, he had three touchdowns to defense by the Sooners, led by Brett Venables. They dominated. Ole Miss, their balanced attack, they they continue to have a balanced attack, and they took care of business against Troy. BYU had 573 yards of offense against USF. This game was delayed for a little bit due to the weather, but BYU... They took care of USF. Uh, Bryce, they got beat up by USC. Caleb Williams, he had 300 yards all by himself. The Trojans, they picked off the Owls on defense four times. And, I mean, it was rough for Rice. Uh, the Baylor running backs, they Baylor whipped up on Albany. Um, running backs for Baylor had five touchdowns. Illinois State, who is not a top team in the Missouri Valley, let's keep that. Let's keep it real. Braylon Allen, you know, and the Badgers were able to run all over them. You know, Allen had 148 yards and two touchdowns. Kentucky struggled for a hot minute against Miami of Ohio. Was tied for the longest time, but then you know, a kick return touchdown. Will Levis with the three TDs he had. They lifted the, those. Lifted Kentucky over Miami of Ohio. Bryce Young had five touchdowns. The tied defense. They shut out the Aggies. It is what it is there. And that's it for week number one. At the end of the day, I got to tell you, what a wild 
you know, weekend of college football, a whole five day feast of college football. And it continues throughout the season until, you know, January 9th. I cannot wait to keep going with y'all. Um, I don't know what the top 25 is going to look like tomorrow. Um, I do have my week two notes about ready to go. And, you know, I'm thinking there there's not as much craziness in week two, but there's still some crazy stuff for week two. But we'll, you know, we'll talk about it all on Wednesday nights, probably. It'll probably be Wednesday night. We'll talk about everything for week two and get you ready for week two. Until that time and until you know thursday when we talk you know the nfl oh boy it's it's coming back the nfl college football you know all sinking together oh boy this is gonna be a good week for the channel make sure you like share comment subscribe click the notification bell do whatever you need to do and i will see you all wednesday night big boy sports signing out and i hope you enjoyed week one of college football like i did